If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. I'm excited today. I've got my friend here, Martin Venter. Yes, we knew each other in Nigeria. It's a long story. He was in free to battalion, but he's got such an interesting history behind that that I have to let him talk. Martin, you're most welcome here. Thank you for coming. I know you're also the treasurer for the Free to Association. Um, perhaps we can also say a few words about that because there are a lot of people who want to assist and they don't always know how to assist. So it's over to you. You're listening. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yes, uh, I'm involved in, in Three to Battalion for the past couple of years. Uh, we always need funds to support our old uh, uh, veterans in South Africa. During the Western Christmas period, we had a shortage of food for some of the old black troops living in Centurion. And what we've done, we've asked for the guys and it was just over four days, we had something like 5,000 rand was donated in the 3-2 VA account. So I think that is the most important thing that we keep on supporting ex-veterans. And also, I think there's a general need for X32 Battalion veterans to have an opportunity on an annual basis. We have got an annual weekend, which the guys come from, from far. Those that are not able to come to Pretoria, we normally set up some Zoom meetings to get the guys in, involved, even from overseas. Because to us, it's important that we keep the legacy of 32 Battalion going. And also, I mean, the sad thing is we are a, a dying a breed. There's no new members coming into 3-2. Therefore, I mean, it's important for the old guys to keep on talking about 3-2 and keep the legacy, as I may say, of 3-2 Battalion going. So, yes, myself, I was a naughty boy. I matriculated in 1976. So the memory is not that good anymore. But what we are trying to, to do is to just tell my story. I started in 1977, January, doing national services. The national service I'd done was at a TDK in Pretoria, the a technical service corps, as the guys normally refer to, the spanner throwers, the, the guys that will keep the, the vehicles going for the military. Obviously, after my a basic service, I could not stay there because I've matriculated in a normal high school. So the first thing that happened is I was recruited to go to infantry school due to the fact that I've got a normal ac academic matric. Uh, but Two days later, a sergeant arrived and they were looking to recruit guys to be trained as section leaders for 3-1 and 3-2 battalion. So obviously, we were interested. A lot of us decided that that's the option we want to go. We had to sign on two years short service. The guys will remember in 1977, I think by the end of the year, the two year service become compulsory, but it wasn't the beginning of the year. So we had to sign on as, as two years short service members to ensure that we will be what trained and go to three, two battalion. So it was a bit of a medical stuff and interviews. And a lot of us were then selected and from Pretoria, we were sent to Three Sai in Pochefstroom, which was a South African infantry unit. Arriving in Three Sai, we were really a weird a bunch of two platoons that had to be now go through a, was a training course. And fortunately for myself, and I can say this directly, I could never handle it to be fucked around. And I mean, my personal view is that the South African military, although we were good, we sit with a massive influx of, of troops, not knowing 
really how to keep the guys busy and what to, what to do with the guys. So during this training, we actually had a, a Sergeant Serfontaine, which was a permanent force member who was supposed to be our, our instructor. Funny enough is this guy arrived at 3-2 Battalion about four months after I have arrived there. And he was rtu because he couldn't handle the situation. So what happened during this training as it is, you've got a lot of troops, a lot of talking going on. And what has then happened is there were some rumors floating that if you went over to Wasmurudesia, you will be able to join the RLI. You must just go to the embassy in, in Pretoria, go and report, and they will give you the necessary Wasm documentation that you can join the RLI. Necessarily to say, there were seven guys of us that went AWOL from for, uh, from three side in Portchestroom. We drove the night, slept at the fountains in Pretoria. The fountains is a very well known area that the people used to, to hang around. We were seven guys and we had two vehicles plus sleeping bags and military equipment that we thought we would need. Necessary to say, the next morning, as the sun rise, well, it wasn't even light. It was short of first light. There were a police car next to our two vehicles. We got a tremendous uh, fright. Luckily, one of the guys that I was with us was an ex-SA a police member. So this guy know how to handle himself. We explained that we were on our way to was Rhodesia to join the RLI. And the issue was the previous night, some long-term guys as, it, as it escaped from Pretoria Central Prison. So the police just told us, guys, please get out of there. You have to leave. Now, of course, once we arrived at the Rhodesian embassy, there were no such thing. They told us that yes, they're keen to receive South Africans in the, in the military, but we need to go to Rhodesia, to the, rec the recruiting office in Salisbury, and actually they will then get us enlisted. The next day, before we could leave for Salisbury, I had a South African passport to get out of the country. One of the, the guys were a, a British citizen, so there was no ways that he could get a passport. So this ex-policeman, and I'm not going to mention his, num his name, took us to the South African passport office. We filled in the forms. One guy signed as the guy's mother, and the other guy will sign as his, his father. Because, I mean, we were all under 18, not knowing what to do. Eddie took these documents. Luckily for us, there was a major incident that stage in Rhodesia where a convoy going to Salisbury was shot up and a couple of people was killed. So this lady was very sympathetic to us. Eddie went and got her some chocolates. We handed in the paper, and by the next afternoon, we had South African passports for the rest of the, the guards. So, on our way, we are. That late this, uh, that afternoon, we arrived in Messina. Obviously, the border was closed after hours, and we had to stay in Messina over till the next morning. The next morning, we crossed the was a border. At that stage, there was a wasn't convoy between Messina and Salisbury. We had an old Austin that was probably from the 60s. And the one policeman had a wasn't Toyota, wasn't Corona. We could not even keep up with the speed of the morning's convoy 
the afternoons got where we went past us on the road. So we were just two South, uh, six South Africans in two cars driving along. Arriving in Salisbury the next day, we went for a place to watch Steve asleep. He couldn't find a place because we didn't have lots of funds available. Went to Wasm Caravan Park, set up in the Wasm Caravan Park. And the next morning, we went to the Wasm Recruiting Office. The recruiting office had no issues taking South Africans. The problem was they only need two things from us. The first one is our, our papers that we were a discharge from the South African military. The second information, we were under 21. We need our parents' authorization to be able to join the military, which neither of us had at that stage. I think the policeman was the only guy older than us. The rest of us were all under 21 years of age. Ne nevertheless to say, I mean, there was no option for us and we had to make a plan. Now, the three guys that actually arrived in 3-2 is myself, Martin Fenter, Peter Ellis, which was a short guy, and the other guy's name is Cliff Wilkinson. The three of us, and then we were taken in by the RLI. But the issue was we had to find a way into the RLI. Peter Ellis, one of the evenings, met somebody that referred us to a major cutter, if I remember correctly, C-U-T-T-E-R. He was a major in the, in the Rhodesian African Rifles, which a base was outside of Salisbury. So the next day, we set, set up an appointment, went to the was base and decided to work to the to talk to this major. All he said to us, are you guys willing to fight? We said, yes. He phoned the recruitment office and he gave them the following inst instruction. I've got South Africans here willing to fight. If you don't take them into the RLI, I will take them into the Rhodesian African Rifles. We were sent back to Salisbury then to the, to the recruiting offices, signed four or five documents, got a recruiting bonus so we could stay in the hotel for the night and had to report at the RLI the next morning in Salisbury. Nevertheless to say, when we arrived in the hotel that afternoon, Peter Ellis's dad was waiting for us in the foyer. He had then via Peter's sister or niece has traced us and knew that we were on our way to Salisbury. So what he has done is he's given us an option either to fly back with him to South Africa in the next a day, or we each had to write a letter to the South African army to say that we have joined the RLI and that we are in the RLI. And I think that actually saved us on the long run. So yeah, the, the next day we went to the barracks. It was sort of a total different environment. And I think this is something that I must say, there was for me a huge difference between the South African Army and the RLI and later 3 2 Battalion, because it was two, the, both the RLI and 3 2 Battalion was two units that was busy fighting a war. And that's a total different scenario than a, than a South African military unit. I think that is one of the important things that, uh, that we. So as we are, uh, arrived, we had to do some refreshment training. I can remember, and I, after 40 years, I'm not certain of the names. There were a lot of Rhodesians or some Abobwins with us. The best guy on course was a guy called Jean-Pierre Le Petit. Not sure that his surname is correct. He was an ex um, French Foreign Legion soldier, which was a brilliant soldier. Then we had Elswick and Eagle, two American Marines, 
that joined the RLI, also brilliant soldiers that could handle themselves, know what they were, were doing. And then I can recall a guy, I cannot remember his name because he came from the American Green Berets. And I think the reason why I couldn't remember his name, I thought he was totally useless. But I mean, that's what you got a lot of uh, foreigners that were good soldiers and a lot of guys that know how to handle themselves. Now, just for interesting sake, I managed to find this and I'll send you a copy. This is my RLI pay book of those years with my RLI number in it. So of course, then it was obviously decided because there was not enough a training facilities within in Rhodesia to train their own paratroopers. And it was decided to send a flight to South Africa to Bloemfontein to the parachuting unit to do a jumping course in Bloemfontein. Now, this is very, it's actually, I think you all know, or people will know there was a book. There's a lot written in the book on Buffalo Battalion, where my story, the story is in there. So we arrived in Bloemfontein to do the uh, course. And funny enough is the next day, somebody shot Martin Fenter. And what was actually two of the guys that has written the trick in the same school as me, that was, so the guys are, did recognize us. So we finished the course, and we were very anxious. I mean, I think we were, we were sweating like hell because we don't know what was going on. Then I think it was a Friday. I mean, I cannot actually remember. We got back on the plane. We were all dressed in civilians. We just took with us to the course some um, one set of uniforms, RLI uniforms for it was a picture that was, was taken. But the rest of the time we were even either in the was jumping suits or in was service in the base. Okay, then we, we got on the plane very happily. Uh, we've made it. Uh, the South African doesn't recognize us, but what we didn't realize, there was a lieutenant that was in three side when we went AWOL from three Sai, and he obviously recognized our three names. When we landed back in Salisbury, the military police was obviously waiting for us. They took us back to the was barracks. I think it was, I, I, I still re think it was a Sunday night when we were, took us separate into a room. There was, there was a, a major that arrived and I mean, a major in the ROI and the British structure is probably like a was a colonel in the South African military setup. He came and talked to us and he said, uh, well, guys, sorry, if it was any other country, we would have kept you. But the South Africans had requested that we return you to South Africa. So that was our fight the next day. We had to hand back uh, all our extra was kit and, and stuff. And late that afternoon, we were driven in two Land Rovers back from Salisbury to Messina. And we were actually handed over to the was commandant there in Messina and later fetched by the military police in a vehicle to take us to the was DV in, in Pretoria. So that was also very, very interesting. Arriving there, I know this uh, a lieutenant said to the Sergeant Major, there was a commandant that said he must look after us. And all he said is they have not been within the was law, so we will uh, treat them that way. So very interesting also, we were not locked up as we didn't have a formal hearing at that stage. So what happened is we were locked up separately, but we were locked up at that stage. And I think not a lot of people are aware of it. 
they were three Cuban prisoners of war that were kept in the Pretoria DD. I've got this guy's names. I know one was, was Pepe, the one was a sergeant, Ezekiel Manteller, a private Roberto de Lima, and a private Carlos Albertos Money Amazing. That's some of the names. I, as I said, I'm not sure, but I think this, uh, I think in, in 1975 they were was captured and they were later ex exchanged for the prisoners of war that was taken during the 1975-76 Savannah incursion into Angola. So these guys were exchanged. So we were actually lucky. We didn't have to was do much. We were kept uh, separately, as I said. We would have done one hour PT in the morning and the rest of the, the time you we were basically locked up. Luckily for us, the PTI corporals or was general corporals as we used to call them, they sort of loved our story. And in the morning when we do PT, the one will say, the first three guys on the other side will rest and he will wink at us. So we had a clear start. So, I mean, it wasn't that bad, but we were, I think, very fit at that stage. So, of course, I cannot under, actually remember it, but we were not there for a long time in the Pretoria DD. I would say between seven to 12 days which was very boring to be locked up. Uh, you locked up in a cell all day. It's not a, a very nice thing. So the next uh, a day, they just told us that we will be fetched this afternoon. Late this afternoon, some of the guys that was, were at, at, at Poch arrived. I think it was between six or eight of them as a formal escort. We were then traveling by a train from the Pretoria, from the Joburg station, if I recall, Joburg or Pretoria station, back to Pochestrum, back to Three Side, back to the was in detention at barracks at Three Side. Now, this whole thing is where Pretoria DB was more formalized. The detention barracks, I think, in Poch had two rooms. So you're all locked up in one large room, six or seven guys. You can play cards during the day, you can discuss. So that is, I mean, like the guys referred to DBS at Durban Beach. That was a Durban Beach compared <laughs> to what happened to us in Pretoria. So one day, Peter Ellis's dad, the same guy's father that come and see us in uh, 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 Salisbury, arranged for, and why I was an advocate that was doing his national service to come and see us. And he asked us all sorts of simple questions. You must remember, according to the uh, military discipline book, we had probably something like 25 uh, uh, what some charges against us because I mean now we were on AWOL, we left our military, we left our con our, our equipment, we left our we left our our rifles unattended and 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 so this lieutenant was then allocated to us to handle our our case. Lucky for us and this I only heard later there was a major at Northwest a commandment, as it was called, the area at Portestrum. He wanted to make an example of us. So when this uh, lieutenant went to him and discussed our case and how he can defend us, he says now he's willing to drop all the charges against us, but he will go to court with a charge of a desertion against us. That means it's actually a civil court against you and you couldn't put in jail for five years because you have deserted. You've deserted the military. 
And apparently all what all that happened is the moment this guy got this official charge sheet, he says to the guys that this will never held up in court because we have not deserted. We went from a safe state to a, a, a war status. But that we didn't know at that stage. Later, we were just told to get our stuff. We're getting removed from the was DB. We were sort of in one a barrack. We're not allowed to mix with any of the Wasm troops. You go and eat in the morning, go and eat in the afternoon, go and eat in the evening. Then at the time, you need to stay in your Wasm barracks, not allowing to uh, mix with somebody. Then the first Friday, we went to the sergeant major and said, we haven't had was a pass for a long time. If you can't get the weekend off. So we had the weekend off. I went with Cliff, Cliff Wilkinson to see his mother because his mother was living in, in, in Bloemfontein who wasn't that far. And so, yeah, we just, our lives carried on, not doing nothing, not knowing what is going to happen to us. So one Friday morning, a lieutenant's step into us and says, you better get addressed. He was the was head of the unit and said to us, you're now going in front of the Wasm Commandant because your hearing will be in, 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 an, in an hour's time. So to put a long story short, I mean, we were listed everything that we've done that we've been able for, I mean, something like close to four months. And 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 uh, afterwards, he just said to do any one of us want to say something, and uh, everybody was quiet. So I just thought, you know, I better say something. So I said to him, Commandant, I just felt like uh, the uh, the court must please realize that we were in the military in this time, and we had some was good training in the RLI. And all he, all he said to me, he said to me three things. First thing was, do you think I'm fucking stupid? The second was, I sentenced you for a 21 days de detention, suspended for two years, and I wouldn't like you in my unit. We'll see what we can do for you. So that was it. And I mean, we're back in barracks. We're staying in barracks. We're waiting to see what is happening. So... The next day, or I think two days later, somebody comes to us and says uh, they're busy preparing our, our transfers. We're going to 3 2 Battalion. Of course, at that stage, I didn't know anything much about 3 2 Battalion. But my question is, and I think a lot of the guys that will watch this video will, will obviously now ask. Why do you send three guys that went AWOL, that is private, to 3-2 Battalion? Because the white leader corps of 3-2 Battalion were all white guys. Yes, guys doing their national service, but most have gone the infantry school uh, route with formal training as either sergeant. Of, and I need to stand back and just to take a bit stand back in in April of that same year of 1977, a permanent force me member, L Lieutenant Farnes Creel, went to a place called Mamohandi. And I always say Mamohandi play a big role in us because Mamohandi is one of the was days that we celebrate in. February 78, when Echo Victor or Eddie Fildun got his honoris crux at Mamohandi, which I was also was present at, at Mamohandi. But back to Farnes Creel. Farnes Creel went with his platoon alone. It's the only white person with his troops to Mamohandi. He ran into a was an ambush. And I've actually got another book here. It's the major incidents of the South African border war. And in there, it's just saying, 18th of April, 1977, during Operation Back 
Workshop in Southern Angola, Nirma Moandi, 12 members of a 3 2 bat a battalion platoon were wounded and another four went missing when ambushed. So, what happened? Farnes was shot in his was in throat. He couldn't speak, he couldn't use the was radio, and he was the only white guy with his platoon. Now, I worked with Farnes later the following year, and I also dragged him back in February because, funny enough, Farnes was shot the second time at Momohandi the following year. I mean, there's no coincidence in that. I mean, that it can happen to the same guy. Farnes is living in the Western Cape. I went and visited him about four years ago. So as I said, because of the fact that they didn't realize we sit with a platoon because Farnes' people were, that was the decision that we were sent to three to battalion. The idea was, and I think we always hated it, although we were, strictly speaking, was private, we were treated as was corporals and later also were promoted to was corporals. But we were called actually sidekicks. We always hated the word when the officer commanding or somebody will have an was order group. They would say there's an order group for the platoon commanders and their sidekicks this afternoon. Now, the sidekick only means that, yeah, that you were in the platoon to handle law and order, to give instructions. And the other thing was, should your, your platoon leader be being wounded, you must take command of the platoon. I mean, that was our role at that stage. So obviously, then we were sent to 3-2 Battalion. Now, funny enough is myself, Wilkinson, and Alice went from the Pretoria station with the Western train. I think it took us something like three days to arrive in Windhoek via a bus from Windhoek to Grootfontein. Arriving in Grootfontein, we had to report and we were told we must just wait. There is some officers that will see us. And funny enough, it was a Commandant Gert Nel, or as I call him now, Wim Gert, and the two Best Beer brothers. Andre Best Beer uh, was later the commanding officer of one recce. He lived across me. We had a lot of discussions. And fortunately, Andre passed away last year. Andre Besbeer. He was also a, a Springbok rugby player. He played rugby for the Western Springbok. What a remarkable man. So, yeah. Then these two breaks, Besbeer Bruce, were, were laughing at our story. But when Gert just listened, he didn't say much. Afterwards, he went with, was with Alice and he just said to us, he was playing pinball with Alice in one of the, the recreation room. Then he just said to us, we're flying with him now back to was Murundu. Then, of course, what I always remember is it, once we arrived in Rundu, um, Gert just said to us, we must sit outside. There was a little congre a congregated iron building which was the HQ of 3-2 Battalion. He told us that we must just go and sit against the wall. They will call us. Now, funny enough, is there was not a cloud in the sky. It was a clear day. And the next moment, the thunders and the blossoms were dying, coming down upon us. And that's how I got acquainted with Sergeant Major Pep van Seil. Um, Pep was one of the major was characters in 3-2. I mean, we as NCOs would later just love it when um, Pep walked up to a lieutenant, halved perfectly, salute the lieutenant, and then say to him, clear, lieutenant, I'm going to fuck you up. I mean, and then Uncle Pep has spoken, and that was Pep von Sayer. 
So we were marched into the commandant's on orders by Uncle Pep as per military. And then I realized Um Gert had a twin a brother because the oak that just flew with us in the plane and the guy that was in front of us with not the same person, it was a different person. And then obviously he just said to us, you guys want to fight? I'll show you the, the white of, of Swapu's eyes. You going to the west now. Now, of course, he could have said south, north, east, any direction, because we had no clue where we were going. And I can't recall whether it was a Gary or a Unimog that we were loaded in. Like most of the other three, two guys that arrived were taken to the, what, the training base in Buffalo, went to an introduction. There was no such thing. I mean, we were taken directly to Umawuni, which was the operational was base. What we didn't know at that stage is that Umgert was in Grootfontein for major meetings, planning the attack on Eheki or Opskrop Dave, as it was said. So that's why they were in a very much rush to get us to Omahoni to go operation. So yes, arriving in Omahoni for a normal South African guy that actually was private that went AWOL. It's just a shock for your system because the next moment you're in a major operation base. You can see here's things happening. We were all allocated by Mkher to a platoon leader. Mine was Lieutenant Rux Grissel, who was, was also a permanent force member at that stage. I had to work with Rux Grissel. I think Peter Ellis went to a Des Berman, which is also one of the was legends of 3-2. And then uh, Cliff Wilkinson, was allocated and led me to the Australian Blue Caddy. He became Blue Caddy sidekicks. So yes, so we were preparing. So we need to uh, start to, to prepare for this major operation, which we didn't have a clue what it was all about. Funny thing that I must just stand back. We had a guy called Milk Man. Milkman was a commandant from Fixburg, uh, was a commando. His name was Jan Martens, Commandant Jan Martens. He had a big beard. He looked like one of these, these commandants in the, uh, in the old Abur War, but a really old gentleman. He called, he some. Sometime the next morning, somebody came to us and says, get yourself some coffee. The commandant wants to talk to you. And I must admit, because I think this is one of the major impact that an officer had on the three of us. Because Jan Martens took us to the side and he said to us, I know what you, you guys have done. We won't adjust you. Just remember one thing. There's no discipline in this unit. You must have the self-discipline. You must control yourself. And remember, things will not be easy, but you need to survive. And I think that was one of the things where I become from a normal private into a leader because now you had to take 30 to 40 troops that were perhaps some of them a double your, your age, you have to command them to take them into a fight. And I think that has changed for a lot of us. Unfortunately, you know, as it is in life, it's one of the things that you really regret I never, I always said I would like to meet with Jan Martens again. I think he passed away about five years ago. So that's also one of those 
regrettable things that you thought you must have talked talk to this man and you never did talk to the man. So I think the next thing is, I mean, now we're at operation and then the next thing is we were in platoons. We had to get our kit and we were taken to the border. Nevertheless, to say Operation Crop Dave or Heki was then happening. Now, there's a lot of behind the, the scene things that we don't know what has actually happened. But the day before we crossed, the day, a day or two before we crossed, there was border. Four reckeys were actually dropped north of Eheke. What happened is they were picked up this afternoon. The same afternoon, Swapu realized they were there. And all I know, I've got the what date that there was some choppers left in Anna, went and fetched the four reckeys at a hot extraction and brought them back to, to Namibia or Southwest Africa. The main thing there about this is that when Swapu must have realized when these guys was extracted that something is going to happen. So we have lost, the Rekis have lost the, the surprise. So I think, and I'm talking under correction, we were about 13 platoons of 3-2 battalion that crossed the border the night going across from the south. Now, 13 platoons is about 400 guys. So we were about 400 men strong going across. We walked the whole night. The next morning, we were split up into two groups. The one group would have gone and do a sweep. The rest of us were lying in an ambush position in a single file platoons, or well, seven or eight platoons of us. But first you must realize we've walked the, all, the whole night. The guys were basically falling asleep as they were sitting and resting. So Swapu went with two sections across from us walking. We didn't see them and we didn't, they didn't see us. Later, one of the machine gunners in the top platoon saw them open fire and Swapu were, were firing at us from both sides. They would withdraw and they ran away. But obviously, the surprise again for the second time, Swapu knew that we were, we were in the vicinity. So we moved, we made, it, made a temporary a basis. And I mean, that night, we were attacked. I'll send you, there was drawings of the plans and so on that you can include it as we moved up. So the next morning, I think it was four o'clock, Swapu hit us with 82 millimeter mortars, recoilers, everything they had. At one stage, I was on the northern side. Uh, they were firing white phosphor 60 millimeter mortars. Uh, to my knowledge, I think at that stage, it was only the Americans that had it. Luckily for us, they exploded it too high. So we, by the time they reached us on the ground, it was already burnt out very few. But the morning, they really nailed us. We lost. I remember, and this is a story for, uh, for another day, when we made this medals that I've re referred to comment regarding the thing that the Rekis has made, they only had one name of 3-2 Battalion on there, which I then talked to Louis Botma, which again referred me to handwritten notes that I had in my house. And I'll send you a copy of, of that handwritten notes where I've written down that the morning a troop was shot in the eye when Swapu moved past us. And the night, Blue Kelly's platoon sergeant 
was shot with an RPG-7 and he was died. So the next day after this major attack on us by Swapu, we got in a chopper to, to bring us ammunition and also to evacuate the two guys that has was died. That's as much. So for the was Rekis, they were actually dropped in the, the wrong position. They walked the, the, the whole day. I think late that afternoon, a chopper plane was sent into the air and they given a direction for the wreckage to move in. They only reached the base between four and five o'clock that afternoon. It was a major fight that we could hear. I mean, the wreckage lost in the contact six persons, which names I, always pro I will also provide. The seven lieutenant died a week or so later in November. He died in one military hospital. So two things I want to highlight about Eheke is the first thing is when we had the 40 year was reunion. It was so great to hear that the members of the recce said it was great after there was some contact. They've made contact with Echo Victor and we marched through this empty plane towards the was Rekis. And the Rekis then mentioned they were very glad to see 3-2 Battalion coming their way. The other very interesting story. I have referred earlier to Farnes Creel. Farnes Krill's ambush at Momohandi. Now, what is very interesting, there was a corporal of the Rekis that found the machine gun that was taken to from Farnes in his contact. The corporal find it within the Wasm trenches of Iheki. Big, Big Daddy saw the machine gun and he then ask HQ to confirm that it is the machine gun and it was confirmed it was coming from him. Funny enough, the guy was called a certain Corporal Funet from the Rekis. He later also received a was Honoris Crux and he, I believe he has died later in also I was in contact. So that's also a very interesting story regarding Ieki and what has happened at Ieki. So I think that is Ieki where I was involved in. As I said, it was my first contact. The other thing that you should soon realize is the three two battalion troops will not accept you until you've proven that you will go through a firefight with them. That was sort of, to me, the acceptance within 3-2 is the moment you've gone through a fight and the Oaks see, listen, this man is willing to make a stand with us. I think that is the most important thing. So that was basically my first major bicep with at the Heki. Uh, and then from there on, I've worked with a number of other platoon commanders. I think in February, before we moved to Mamohandi, Farnes came back uh, and I was allocated to Farnes Creel as his sidekick. Now, I think the other major thing is Mamohandi, where Echo Victor or Big Daddy, Eddie Falyun, he was at that stage the second in command. Commandant Gert now was, he was an OC officer commanding 3-2. And Echo Victor or Eddie Falyun, or a major Fanega Law as he was also called, he was the second in command, but he has done operations with us. He was with us in Eheki. So on the 7th of February, 19, 
1878, we crossed the border with fly, five platoons going towards Mamohandi to look for a Swapu, a base that we believed was situated near Mamohandi. We went past Mamohandi north and then we, came out, we came down to the south to Mamohandi. And uh, we actually ca captured a person that we believe was a Swapu a terrorist just north of Mamohandi. We, we told us we must not approach the Mamohandi base from either the north or the south, but rather from the east going west. We split up two platoons, went around the Washmashana, the open area, and the three of us, the three other platoons come from the north. Obviously, the two platoons from, from Kori Bienaka and uh, he was wounded there, the other lieutenant, I'll get to his name, Steve Barnard was the other platoon leader. When they come to this, there the was south of the Shana, they walked into a, was, a, a was an ambush because Swapu has done a recce and realized our, our modus of, of, of operation. Uh, they walked in the ambush, a couple of guys got shot. I don't think anybody got killed there. And then Swapu immediately started firing 82 and 60 a, a millimeter mortars over our heads. We came down in an extended line. Johan Lowe's platoon was on the right. Myself and Fana Skrill were in the middle and Dan de la Reis platoon were on the left. And as we, we walked, Swapu has moved back into the Swapu base, dicked was a trenches, and we walked directly into the Wasm base, which ended up with a huge firefight that we had there. We nearly ran out of ammunition. We were lying there. Uh, uh, I think it was one of the biggest uh, days of my, of my life, as I can remember this firefight. It was a hell of a firefight. I always say that I will never for, forgive the South African military because they give you this good uh, training to say the first thing you do, you, you identify there was a target, you make contact, you win the firefight, you move through the target, to, through the target and you regroup. But of course, they never tell you what to do if you don't win the firefight. <laughs> and I mean, we had instances where we didn't manage to get the firefight and the way Swapu was actually getting into us. It was getting light. We were lying in a small circle. Our ammunition was almost depleted. I know at one stage a chopper get in, but the fire was too heavy and he had to return back to South Africa. So, I mean, uh, to, to Namibia, to return back across there was border. So that was uh, very bad. We laid there for, there was night. And the next morning we started uh, to regroup. A uh, wrote in his book, amongst the, the wounded was a soldier who had been left for, a, death the previous night. Early in the morning, Martin Fenton noticed he was still alive and called the medical orderly at once. But nobody had any hope for the man who was shot between his eyes. To make matters worse, Martin's platoon radio operator has gone. With him was the pl platoon's B-20 radio and all the maps and codes. So, I mean, we were in a desperate situation. Uh, luckily, that night we've heard vehicles coming from the was north. So Swapu has vacated the was a base at Mamohandi. They've moved their guys out. So the next morning we decided to was regroup, move through the was a base, and then uh, a match up with the other two platoons, and then move south. I can remember at one stage the troops were given an option to actually leave. We had something like seven or eight guys killed in this, this, this contact. We had to walk out. So we decided, should we leave the 
our bodies there in Angola or leave. And it was sort of, the troops said, there's no ways they will, will carry out the wounded and there was dead bodies. We carried them out, we left. Something that's also missed, I saw in a couple of books, it was mentioned that Swapu say they haven't lost anything, any, anyone in that contact. I can remember moving to the Wasm trenches. I was right that there was a back, some of the Wasm last guys moving out. There were bodies lying in the Wasm trenches and somebody has jumped on it. You can only see the guy's feet and his head sticking out. Obviously, the boots were removed. How many was actually killed of Swapu? I've got no idea. I saw bodies. There was definitely guys lost in this, this contact, but we had to move out. Then just remind me to come back to the previous evening because that had a major impact on my life later this year. At one stage, as I said, one of the, the platoon commanders was a Lieutenant Johan Lowe. Johan Lowe was actually in the same school, high school as me in Petersburg. He was just about three years older than me, so he was pretty one stage when we were surrounded, I said to him, to, as in Afrikaans, Vanag is alles on hulle kant. And everything, everything is on their side. And he said to me, God is still on our side. Now, one of the things that I didn't mention is in moving past this operational a base, you see the uh, bodies lying. But th there was also some reach screens as the Swapus has, has built where they have kept some of their, their possessions to keep it out of the rain. Now, there were uh, Bibles under some of these rats. And that I will come back at the end because that haunted me for a long time in later years. Once I was thinking about Johan's words, and we can discuss this at some point. Now, the other thing we must just record as well, on the 19th of February, 1978, just after we had this major bash up at Mamohandi, Johan van der Nest was captured at the water hole at Ilundu. Significant thing is, Johan van der Nest, according to what I know, was the only South African that was ever captured by Swapu and taken away as a prisoner of war by Swapu themselves. And he was, I think, and I'm talking under correction, he was a POW for four years and he was later exchanged for a Cuban or a Russian spy and brought back to South Africa. So that also happened. The other thing that's very interesting, that same night after Van der the Nest was killed, they, they killed, there was, there was an ambush on there was a border at Beacon 26. And the guys shoot, I won't say it wasn't Chinese, but somebody that looked like it wasn't Chinese was killed in an ambush there. And interesting, this oak had a brand, brand new AK-47 with him. So this is what was also interesting about my time in 3 to the Terry. Now in 19, May 1977, it's actually a very sad, operation that was done. It was Operation Reindeer. And Chris, I actually, and I'll send it to you, I'll send you a copy. You verloop van die operatie. It says how this operation was going. And 3-2 was tasked to clear a couple of areas which we knew they were Swapu a basis uh, wasn't present. 
for the first time, we had four, five, five cannons as to support us. I think that's the first time in three, two battalions history that we actually had other than mortars to support us in a venture. So the morning when we passed, we came to a place called China Gulf. We had a brief contact and Swap then was dispersed and we moved on to the known base. We went down. We were walking in a, a box formation, as they say. And as we went down, Instead of one cannon firing a shot to get the, the range ready, all four cannons fired. We could feel the air and the leaves and stuff moving as close as it was. And I can remember Blue, Blue Kelly, he was a staff sergeant at that stage, coming on the, in the air saying to Echo Victor, sir, they need to lift the fire. And Blue Kelly answered by saying, sure, Blue, they will. And the next moment, it was chaos, havoc. An air burst exploded on the, on the right-hand corner of us and the other contact right between us. And guys were lying wounded with, with scrap. Now, I think at that stage, one guy was killed immediately there. And the other one, uh, I think something like 12 or 13 were injured. So that means the whole operation came to a, a halt. We had to move back. I was actually called because Kovas Tron, which was a sergeant got also hit by some of the was with shrapnel. And he didn't look that serious, but uh, he, he had to be, was, had to be was Kazabakt. We moved uh, back, erated, created, there was chopper pads, there was chopper came in. It took us, took the was wounded out, brought some ammunition in for us. Then obviously we had to settle off for the was night. All our kids were on the vehicles back. The vehicles couldn't get to us. So we had to sleep. Of course, I can remember me and another guy called Andre Retief. He was a platoon sergeant or sidekick for one of the other platoons. We made ourselves a, a large a trench to us to sleep in. And I can remember every night each cannon will fire four shots on registered targets in front of us. And I can remember that every time that that cannon was firing, you keep shaking. I mean, it's just an emotional thing that doesn't matter whether you're scared or not scared, you keep on shaking. So we survived, there was night. The next day we moved on we moved past, this was a base, and I can remember it was fairly late at night when we regrouped. And according to what my issue is, is on the 7th, at 7th of May, 1978, close to eight o'clock at night, it seems like Swap had only two or three 120 millimeter rocket launches. The first rockets come from the north upon us. And what I will always remember, myself and Gerard Retief has, has digged an enormous a trench where our two platoons was meeting and we were lying in the strings. And I had a little a gas stove on wanting to make some coffee sitting on the train. And as the two 122 millimeters come, we just passed each other and landed in the trench. And I put on the stove. I said to him, Retief, I'm not going to make coffee anymore. And he also says, no, he's not going to eat. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, 
those are the things that, that, that you, you always remember. So, I mean, sad to say, Kubistron was wounded there. He was taken back. And in the beginning of June, I came to R&R &R back home to my parents in West Petersburg. Uh, and I think it was fourth or so of May, the morning. I was due. I actually came to Pretoria the Sunday evening because our flight was on the was Tuesday to go and see how how our quivers was doing. And as I arrived the afternoon at one mole, he was not looking good. Johan Lowe was at that stage also there with was some scrap mill that he's picked up in hospital. And he said to me, he doesn't know that since yesterday, Kubis is not looking well. So the next day, as I arrived in Rundu, as I went into HQ, the signalers confirmed that Kubis has just died in one mole. So he was one of the oaks that were killed by friendly forces or our own, own Russian cannons. And it's a, it's a sad thing, but I mean, that's the reality of war. You know, something that comes to mind now as I'm talking to you is you look what's happening in the Ukraine and what is happening with, I mean, yeah, I know the whole country is going to peace, but the, the emotional impact it must have on that, that population to be bombarded in that way must just be incredible. And I just want to say, you know, my heart goes out to those people in the Ukraine because they must be suffering tremendously. So, I mean, that is Quibus. Then somebody I just want to talk about is a guy called Opis, Second Lieutenant A.L. Opperman. I started working with Opis, I'm not sure exactly when, I think it's, it is after uh, uh, Mamuandi, he came in as a new platoon commander, huge stocky guy, I think he was a Springbok rower, uh, I was a strong guy, very nice guy. Obviously, only the two of us with a platoon in, in the field. I mean, we used to stay for six weeks in the field at minimum. Sometimes it was extended to eight weeks. So you start knowing a guy and working with him. One our major, I won't say arguments, but major disagreements was always in winter. I would hear Opis moving in his sleeping bag and I will not make a move. I'll wait for him to get up, collect some wood until he's made a fire. Then I would get out of my sleeping bag and go and hang on his fire and all say, listen, you're supposed to be the platoon sergeant. I'm the lieutenant. You to make you use must make the fire. And I'll say now, Opis, you're so good at fire making, it cannot happen. So I mean, I worked with him. He was a nice guy. And at some stage, again, as it was customary, the old guys got split into different, uh, different units. At that stage, I worked with one of the was Kruger brothers called Sarl Kruger, who was also a permanent force guy, uh, a, a, a Tupac Lute. Sarl was just a, a brilliant guy that I worked with. Uh, then Opis went and worked with Andre uh, uh, Retief. So on the 6th of, of September, and I can recall, we were uh, lying about two, two kilometers apart from each other in temporary was a basis. They were on to our west, and we were close to our border of where we used to work through the west. So in the morning, I said to Sarl, I'm going to take a, plat uh, a was section and do a, a, a patrol to the west. Not knowing to us, there was a water hole. And I must tell this story about this water hole at some stage as well. Because, I mean, we used to walk for miles to collect water. Lane. And 
apparently what happened, their radio or batteries were out of service. So at this water hole, they have left a message for us on a stick in this water hole to say, when we went to collect water, we will get the message. But I was going on a, on a, a patrol to look for spoor to the western side. While Opis at the same time decided he's going to take a patrol right to the, at the cat line because what Swapo used to do, they would move along on the northern uh, side and look for a place where they all would cross into Namibia. That I didn't know. So as we were walking, and of course I'm not sure how far we didn't walk, we didn't uh, walk that far. I remember I showed to the guys there was a little was a path and we was looking for some tracks and I just showed and they went went down. Uh, I think we were about was twelve. And what the moment we went down, one of my corporals took a tin of of Fanta Fanta orange out of his ammo pouch, opened it and gave it me to take a sip. And as I took the sip, the sh there was some shots were ringing out. So now I don't know if it's Sarl that get, that's getting attacked or is it somebody further to the north. So I said to the guys, okay, let's run. And we run to the was a border, to the cut line, so that we can look on the road where it is. And as we arrived, we could see it's down in the little dip past us. There was a little dip. There were stuff burning and things going on because it was a quick contact and it was over and done. And then the next moment, Andre Retief came on the air and he said to us, it is Opis. Opis was shot. So what happened is Opis moved with a section with his platoon sergeant. As they came to the north, to the was southern part of the was cut line, his, the section went down. He and his sergeant walked to the road to look for a spoor. There was a, something like a 40 double man ambush on the other side. And unfortunately, he walked right into the machine gunner on point, which pulled him across his body and he was killed instantly. What also, I've got two things. And I think the first thing is, I think he saw the machine gunner that shot him. He must have realized that there was machine gunner. The other thing is, later when we picked up Opis, he didn't even have a, a bullet in his chamber. He didn't expect anything, and he was killed. Okay, then I went back to Sarl, to the platoon. We, we was regrouped. We brought Opis' body across to the southern town part of the cut line. We got on the radios and then obviously, and I, I, you know, it felt like minutes. It's, it happened so quickly. The two, two aloes came ac across and there wasn't a puma come and it just hoovered. And I always remember it as we put Oppie's body into the was chopper. And I think it was Kubis van Rooyen was the guy that was in the chopper. He kicked us out two cases of beer and we sat there and we drank up two cases of beer. You know, and, and, and I always say that is one of, of the most things that you cannot believe. And working with Oppies, he always were talking that he had some feeling that something is going to go wrong with him. He just had that feeling. And eventually he was killed. Now, another thing that I've made notes of is in November uh, in 1978, I was in South Africa. One of the guys in at Buffalo, Rudy Brits, guys were swimming in the water. He was taken by a, a crocodile at Buffalo. We never saw the guy again. He's gone. We have nobody has seen him again. So I mean, that's one of the other incidents where 
a guy got killed and he's gone. Then obviously in January 1979, I finished my it was two years. I clawed out and at the, I think at that stage, I was just finished with 3-2 Battalion. Nevertheless to say, I never realized that uh, it will have an impact on my life because, I mean, I came back to South Africa. I've studied. I got a BCom degree working for Anglo. I carried on. And then in 2004, it just happened that I was out without a job, uh, not knowing what to do. The company closed down where I was working after Angla, and I was just really in was the highest straits. Uh, made some contact with the three two guys, and within two weeks, I got a a contract to go to Afghanistan to work for an American company in in Afghanistan. And uh, you know, it's so so strange because early in the 1990s, I was in a funeral in Valcom. And I also met one of the was legends of 3-2 Battalion, Lawrence Duplessis. He was actually called Fed Dup by most of the was guys. And the sad thing is, I mean, I worked there. I was a support services manager for a large company. We had a lot of South Africans. We had a, more than a thousand locals working for us at was guards. At one stage, we had approximately 120 Gurkha troops working for us. I still have got the Gurkha in it again. So Lawrence was the project manager for the ANA barracks that was delivered, that was developed by Fluor in Khost in Afghanistan. Sadly to say a day before myself and Dupi had a bit of an argument, him and our country manager, Lawrence Duplessis, decided to, to fly back the next day. Dupi had to, to go back to Horst and, and uh, George von Skalkweg, who was our country manager, just said to us this morning, he's going with Dup on the, on the was chopper. He will return later the day. Three hours later, the assistant project manager on host contact us saying what's happened to the was the chopper. The chopper has never arrived. The chopper flew into the mountain, bad clouds, and all 14 people on board were killed. One of them, as I said, the a 3-2 legend, it was a Russian MI8, uh, was the chopper. There's a lot of speculation, but at the end of the day, I mean, I've got the photos, the guys went to the mountains. I think they were killed on impact. And it is something that just happened. So I think those are, are, are one of the things. I came back from Afghanistan. I'm now working for a uh, international mining company for the past 12 years. Uh, I will probably reach retirement age November next year when I'm 65. So then I will retire. I'm still involved in 3-2 Battalion. I am the treasurer of the 3-2 Battalion Veterans Association. And we're still trying to get the, the, the groups together. So of course, at this stage, I think... Uh, we must just look at all the things I've missed that I also need to do or discuss and must tell you about. And I have to say to you, I've met his wife, and she's a wonderful lady. Oh, yeah, no, no, yeah. She's in, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. She's, a, she's, uh, I still got her on, say, on, on, on Facebook somewhere. But there's something else I also need to share when uh, we start. This is Eagle Strike. This is the book of Jan Breitenbach on the attack on Kasinga. I wasn't at Kasinga quiz. I've never been there. One doesn't claim to be there. This is a photo of myself and Jan, Jan Breitenbach, the famous Jan Breitenbach. 
I got this book from Oom Jan, and he's written in front of you. Beste Martin, jou eiwoler, jou wegloop Arl Aitu het jou goed uitgewerk vir drie twee bataljon. In English it means I'm an eiwoler, I went absent without leave, but my eiwoling to Arl I has worked out well for three two battalion. Now another misconception about the attack on Kasinga. He mentioned this book in his book. This is a cadre of Nkontwe Suzwe that was at Kasinga. He actually confirmed that Kasinga was a military base. He actually wrote on that day, we were about five miles from Kasinga when I saw the back smoke on the, uh, on the, on the uh, horizon ahead. At first, I thought it had been a fire, some accident at the command post. Then an Angolan soldier pointed at the glints. We realized mir mirages had come back and were here in force. Kasinka was under air attack. So I said, this is, this is one of the things I probably paid more for to get the book in South Africa because you cannot find it here. But that's also where some of the misperceptions about the war can be found and can be read. Well, I'm glad to hear that because, you know, Mark, and there's so many lies out there. And that's why it's fantastic to have a privilege to speak to you people. And as luck would have it, when this episode comes out, this is the day, day before, we hope, uh, or is it the week after? I think it's a week <laughs> after this one. Uh, General McGill Alexander, the paratrooper general, is talking yes. about Kasinga. Now, he wasn't at Kasinga, but he was very much involved afterwards to see what went wrong and how they could improve. And he did that as a brigade commander at uh, 44 Parachute Brigade. So that's fascinating to me. But now I have to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. No, um, sure. Why go ahead. <clears throat> Do you think, Martin, that the RLI, even in that short time I had hold of you guys, did they play a major role on you or did you not learn that much from them? I, I think we've learned a lot, a lot from them in that stage course. But what I must also admit, I mean, it's not about learning so much. It's the way, the first thing that impressed me is when an instructor at the RLI was given an instruction, he will tell you about the book and then they will tell you in practical. So difference between, and I must put out this was not difference. An RLI instructor was somebody to me that had experience he was in the field, you know what he was talking about. For us, the guys went to infantry school and they become uh, instructors and they haven't got that detailed knowledge of what you're doing. Same as I referred earlier, this permanent force Permanent Force Corporal who used to be our instructor, Serfontaine. I mean, obviously this guy has lacked the military experience. And this is what I say, I think for me is, we were forced to learn as we were going on, uh, along. And remember the three, two troops were experienced. You can rely on that guy, you could learn from them. I mean, it's actually embarrassing for you as an AWOL troopy now to take charge of 30 to 40 guys that know their way, they know how to fight. They were professional soldiers, they know what they were doing. And I mean, that's why I see the major difference. The other thing is also, there were no faffing around in the RO. If you've done something wrong, the corporal will say to you, you owe me one, you owe me two, you owe me three. When it's PT, you will suffer. There, the other thing that I've met in the RLI is a thing called a, a marble. The marble is a piece of steel pipe, thick, and it's filled with cement. But the problem is it's not filling, filled with cement, it's filled off balance. The one side you can barely get your hand in and the other, and I mean, that is the most difficult thing I have in experience. I could run, but I haven't got strong arms, so I've never, I mean, that just killed me. 
But as I said, there was no faffing around. The guys were was professional. The food were, were very good. Uh, I mean, the other experience to me is the first day we appeared on, on, on a parade for a, a drill exercise. Remember, the, the RLI was a typical a British military. You had black boots with stats and then a green shirt. And the corporal will not tell you, you must fix your boots. He will tell you, listen, your boots is not shining. Tell the Batman he must do a better job. So you have got a Batman that will do that for you, which, you know, somebody in the military army or in the, you, you know, we didn't think about it. I mean, that's something because each bungalow had a, a Batman to do the ironing, the cleaning and the washing. Because as I said before, these guys had a war to fight. They haven't got time to faff around. Yes, and the Rhodesian Light Infantry is a fantastic unit. I mean, it's one of those legendary units. Now I'm wondering what happened to your other mates, the ones who got to a few, to RLI, then R2. Well, I'll send, you, I'll send you a picture. Uh, Cliff Wilkinson, I've met later, later years. He's in Valcom. He has got his own, own uh, filter business in Valcom. He's also a farmer. I will send you a picture of myself and Peter Ellis. Uh, Peter Ellis, I have was at my house a couple of years ago, ago, but I've also lost contact with him. He's doing some IT work for farmers in the Delmas area, as far as I know. But yes, the two are, are very much uh, up and going. I know uh, Cliff was in in racing cars. He's built he's built his own Formula Bs. Unfortunately, in the late nineties, I think it was. He built himself an aeroplane and he fell down in, in Valcom. So Cliff has taken a what a health knock. But no, they are the two of them are still very much alive and as I say, above ground. I just want to say to the viewers here at Legacy, we are planning an Iheke episode, which will be with free to battalion. Certainly Martin will be involved, we'll get the Ricky guys together as well. And we do have a career brews actually signed up, the Kruger brothers, the remaining ones. And sadly, the, the one you knew. He died in a parachute accident, wasn't it, at uh, one recce? Uh, he was at one recce. As far as I know, he was in one recce and he had a problem with his, his parachute. And I believe, and I'm not 100% correct, it was actually an, an, an ex exhibition uh, jump that went wrong. And uh, Sorrel then got killed. But yes, the, those brothers are legend for all being in 3 2. Yes, my soul rest in peace, as all the others. You know, the one thing I see a lot with you people, Martin, there's so much camaraderie. Camaraderie, or is that in English? Yes, camaraderie, yes. And, uh, between the 3 2 battalion members. But now I have to ask you, you know, I've been taking notes as you speak. Tell me about the swap of Bibles. Well, I, I think for me, the main thing is that, that Swapu was also reading Bibles. And um, just get to get back, I mean, we were actually in circle that night at Mamawandi. And I said to Johan Lo in that uh, short words, doesn't, uh, doesn't really matter that everything is then tonight is on their side. And uh, he said to me, no, God is still on our side. And that wanted me actually in my later life. Uh, I struggled with the fact that uh, how can we think that God is taken side? And of course, it also happened that after the, after the major contact at Momohandi, there was a seal tiffy or it was in Germany, as they say, that came and visited us at the Lundu, the couple of white guys that were there. And he actually read Psalm 121 for us. You know, uh, Psalm 121 is, I look up at the mountains where my, my help come from, and the other guy said, similar to me and Johan, my help is from was a God that will help you. 
But I soon realized that you really look into Psalm 121. There's a later verse close to the end. If in Afrikaans it says, your seal shall I bewaar. Your soul he will protect. And that to me is the important thing. God is not taking sides. God has taken some good friends of ours in the first of the battle. Some guys has lost their lives from 3-2. A lot of guys from Swapu has lost their life. What it means to me, all that God is saying, he will protect your soul. It's not saying you're not going to die. It's not saying you're going to uh, live long. Some of us are just luckier than others. And that is something that I struggled for a long time to resolve for myself. And while we're talking about resolve for myself, the other issue I had, I was one night taken on for not, not understanding post-traumatic stress. And the stress that the guys were both through and that. And uh, there was another office in 3-2, which is also was in Durban. And I talked to his wife and she said to me, the interesting stuff is that half of the 3-2 guys that made it and carry on with their lives and that half didn't. And, and I know this is very controversial, but this is my own saying. I don't, I don't say there's no such thing as post-traumatic stress, but if you look at the guys, the, the uh, USA guys that fought in Vietnam and all that, my vision of this is, course, is that people has got the idea, and it's not only soldiers that was in fight, it's people that get robbed. Because I've experienced a certain thing in life, Life owes me something. Life owes you nothing. Me and my kid always had a fight when he said to me, life is unfair. He would say, dad, it's unfair. And I would say to him, life is unfair. Get flipping used to it. And I mean, that's the bottom line. Life is unfair. You must get there and carry on. Some people, I agree, has got the ability to take the stress and handle it much better than other guys. Perhaps I'm one of the most lucky ones. I mean, to me, the biggest thing in life happened to me 20 years ago. And I think that's the thing I never want to experience again. It's the day when I had to tell my kids their mother has died. I think that was the most difficult thing in my life. But you get the most strength to handle it. Yeah, I can imagine that must be a very, very hard thing. But it's not easy. No, it's not easy. What happened the night before that big battle at, um, what is it? Moabli. Mamuandi. <laughs> yes, sorry. Yes, you, no, you, you said I must remind you of that. You mean during the night? Because what happened is we crossed the, the border early this afternoon. We had a contact late the afternoon. And we then were basically the two groups, the two platoons on the south and the one platoon on the north were separated. And we only regroup the next, next morning to move out. There is something that has happened that some three, two guys were unhappy about. Because the next day, as I explained, we moved to the south after we have regrouped. There was some choppers came in, and I cannot remember if it was two, pum, two pumas or three pumas and aloes that came in. They dropped some parabats to walk out with us. And there was a story later years that the parabats had to rescue three to battalion, which is so far from the truth as you can ever get here. Yeah. And I think that is one of the things that the guys, some guys were unhappy about. Okay, now, now I understand. I've heard that rumor myself. And it, it might yeah, what has happened is only the next morning, as I said, late the afternoon, while we were in contact, two allies came in from air support. 
And again, Kurs, I'm talking under correction, but they took a lot of fire and they had to withdraw. There is somebody that believe one of the uh, barrels actually dropped out of one of the water chopper. If it was a spare uh, barrel, I don't know. But I mean, I have got no proven evidence to say. And all I'm saying, they came in, they fired two rounds, and I think uh, Corey Duplessis actually shouted on the chopper to say, go away, you you're firing on own, own troops, because it was chaos on the Western ground. But yes, there was that unhappiness about Momoandi, because there was a rumor, and I would say it's a rumor, that the Parabats had to rescue three two. Okay, so tell us the water roll. What happened at the water roll, Martin? Well, as I said, at the water roll with Johan van der Meest. Uh, you know, there's there's a little there's a lot of misperception, and I've, as I said to you. I have now invited Johan van der Mest and I was at his house probably two weeks ago to uh, talk to him. And uh, there's also a book written, and let me just get it for you. The book is called Van Abu. That, and this is the story of Johan van der Mest. There's also a was DVD available, the capture and the cap, the capture that Rina Uesta has made with Botti's assistance. Now, first, just to mention before I talk about von der Mest, very interesting about this book is the fact that it highlights the fact that the Dorsland trackers that went to South Africa via Southwest Africa, Namibia. To Botswana. They were the first guys that had shit with the Uwambus. <laughs> so the story about the conflict between the Uwambus and the farmers go a long, long, long way. Now, Van der Mest was captured at the water hole at Ilundu. Now we must remember one thing. There's a lot of rumors that went about. The first thing is Van der, Van der Mest went across out of his own world to swap. There's a rumor like that. There is a rumor that Van der Mest was just a slag troop. The main thing that guys for, for, forget about Van der, Van der Mest is, a, is, is what, three things. Three, three things, sorry. First thing is, he has completed his national service. He was doing a camp when he was at the water hole at Ilundu. He was actually a sapper, which means he was a non-combatant. Non Van der Nest's role was to ensure that he cleaned the water from the water hole for the guys at Ilundu. They were fetching water at the water hole at Ilundu. Now, my, my view of this, and I saw the video, a danger or Shupala, which is now also dead, was the commander of so-called Swapu Rekis. The problem is he promised Sam and Yoma that he will capture a boo, that he will. So what he has done, some of the locals were his informants at the water hole. And they told him that Van Ernest is staying in the tent. And what will happen is, and I cannot remember which side it was, but the guys that was at Ilundu base went on patrol. When they came back from patrol, a section will go out as their rest week at the water. And their role was to protect from their nest. So obviously, if you have done a recce on that water, you will have realized this one guy is always sleeping in the Wasmi tent. He's protecting, by, protected by the section all the time. So it was taken that he must have a leader role because the guys was looking after him. So that is the von der Mest story. And they came at night to the water hole and they shot. And I actually got somewhere it is recorded 
They took some R1 rifles, some webbing. There was a lot of stuff taken and they took Van der Mest across the was border. There was actually an operation, a follow-up operation done after that of Red to try and recapture Van der Mest. But as I said, that never materialized. But one of the uh, most amazing things about Van der Mest is he was married at that stage. He had a small baby. Van der Mest is still married to the same wife after all these years. They stand together through everything, which I felt really amazing. For a guy that has been a prisoner of war, locked up in Angola, locked up in, uh, in Germany before he was released, in East Germany, if I'm not correct, and he's still married to the same wife. To me, that says something. No, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. And when you speak to Jan van der Meest again, please tell him. He's welcome here at Legacy if he wants to come. I, I, I will tell him and I'll arrange something, even if we can just arrange a quick Zoom session with him to talk to him. I think that is that is good. There is a couple of things that I've got. For example, Big Daddy's Asia is covered in this book. Uh, my whole story is in, in Buffalo Battalion. I mean, there's a couple of actually very funny stuff in here where I had a, a, a court loop R Ian, R Ian which, which barrel was so off after it was bended. And I used that with the, with the G3 uh, Blitzbreaker. You, you've seen this book. You know this book. You know Tony Vieira on the front of this book? He was also with at, 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 at Momo Andi. One of the interesting stuff about Tony is when Big Daddy had scrap null and Johan Lowe was bleeding, Johan Lowe was rubbing his face, looking at his hands, and Tony was doing the same thing to see if he's not bleeding. You know, those are the kind of things that you remember for the rest of your life. You never forget it. But yeah, I think that is in, in short, I mean, uh, what we've discussed. If there's anything else, I mean, but feel free to come back to me. Uh, I'll make copies of this. What I've also got is I've done a presentation of Mama Handi and I'm, there's maps in there and photos. I'll just put names to them and send it to you. You can see what you can use if there's anything you want to use. I'll do that. We can even perhaps put the link in and people can download it and look at it later if, if you don't mind. I'll put it at the back. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions for you, Martin, so you might have to come back. And that's perhaps... Yeah, I mean, I mean, the other thing is, I mean, if guys really want to, I mean, I've got no, I mean, if guys want to ask questions, I mean, by all means, we can come back and, and, and discuss them. I mean, I, for example, if uh, my beret is hanging in my corridor, I framed it, so I have got a spare beret, but my original medals and stuff, plus the original, let me fetch it and just show it to you. Oh yeah, this is what I can also send you at some stage. That's the official days that is recognized by 3-2 Battalion, Remembrance Days. Yes, that would include Savati, which we made the episode on, which we yeah, did the holy day for three two. It says Foundation Day, Eeki Day, Mamuandi Day, Savati Day, Super Day, Forte Day, Lomba Day, Resettlement Day, and Disbanded Day. Those are the nine days. And I'll send you this. It's in the presentation. It's a map of Eeki, how the operation went. It's in that Eeki presentation. But I'll send it all to you and you can have a look. I'll send it to you this afternoon and you can have a look. Anything else, Chris? No, that's, that's basically it. Um, if you wish, you can quickly show us your beret. So just take a picture of it and I'll put it in for us here. I must tell you people, it's fascinating to me to see how many things these people get. Oh, yeah. That's magnificent, my man. Huh? Yeah, this is the original, this is my original operational map. There's the border. There's Eeki. There's Momoandi. 
Oh, yeah, no, well, I wouldn't want to know how you got hold of that map, but you kept it. I kept it. I kept it. <laughs> With your other notes. So that was... No, no, the... this, is, this is our, our um, procedure to do. There was daily separate sit rap. This, I must be honest, is actually Farnes Creel when he was shot. It was in, in our... Uh, in our um, it was buried and I got it uh, there. I still got, when we got, I got it from one of the guys and there's still the old compass that we used to use. And it worked better than GPS. You never got lost. Yeah, we never got lost. And this is my... Yeah, you're still looking good, Martin. Yeah, well, somebody said to me over this weekend, I still, I said, yeah, but we're all, all getting old now, but uh, we're surviving. I mean, that's the important thing. And the great thing, of course, is the association, which is keeping, you know, everybody together as far as possible. Yeah, we have now registered our, our emblems, everything that is on this. We've now registered these emblems. So yeah, that's the next thing. I'm actually making large ones of this for us to use in Wasm Sem uh, ceremonies because it's very nice. This is a bit of an old one, but it's still working. Yeah, that's very good. I think I saw one with Franz Fauré when we were recording him his first uh, episodes. Okay. There was one hanging behind him all the time. Yeah, I was, I, I've actually uh, missed Franz. I thought he was there before me as part of Jan Breitenbach, but he was actually in the recce group that came after me. So, but yeah, I know Franz. He was uh, one of the, the guys that actually made this Ieki thing. And it was actually him that I cornered and says, listen, you've got only got one name on here. He must be two of three, two. And they've now put the two, three, two battalion guys' names on there. So, but this is very nice. And obviously something that I haven't mentioned, my radio name was King Kong. For what reason, I don't know, but we all had this funny radio names. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing this uh, I was King Kong. I was the biggest King. man in the world, I mean. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, but, I mean, you can actually, and I must actually send it to you. Uh, the major things of, of our time, uh, list of operational names. There's a list of operational names. I mean, Steve, Steve Barnard was called Wimpy, Pete Boertes Phantom, We Bought My a Devil, Peter Bells Archie, Jan Breitenbach Carpenter, Des Berman Popstar. Then a guy like F.L. Smith, the famous F.L. Smith, he was called cop because he was a speed cop at one stage. So, I mean, it's just amazing. No, it's fascinating to see all these traditions in action. Thank you for your time, Morten. We really appreciate you. Thanks, Chris. Very much uh, to your wife as well. Yeah, I will tell Erna she's working. She's now low coming, so she's doing her own thing. But uh, it's going well with us. Um, my mother is in Polokwane. I'm going there for the weekend. But otherwise, it's, it's, you know, it's going well. You've got so much to be thankful and grateful of. I had an incident three weeks ago at church. They stole my fortune. You know, and, and, and it sort of break you down. And then I said to somebody last week, listen, yeah, they stole my fortune. But I could have been one of guys, that guys in, in Ukraine that they had to flee with my whole life in a bloody plastic bag. So, you know, we still lucky with, we've got so much to be grateful for. I mean, on Saturday evening, people that rent my, oh, on Sunday last week, the people that rent my flat phone and the flipping DB board was on fire after. And I said, you know, it's like, um, um, uh, what was die ou man sy naam? Een van die kerkman, hy het een nog gesê, hy het nog nooit een lijkswaar gesê met een venterwaantje achteraan en jy vat niks saam nie. 
En ek dink, dit is een van die goed dat ons maar moet onthou. Nou, dit is fantastic, Rieboek. So, so my saying, my saying, lately I'm becoming a real miner. Any day above ground is a good day. Well, let's hope that they, uh, before you go on the ground, let's, uh, let's hope it stays far away. But that brings me to an important point, actually. I mean, we've been trying uh, to, to record several people. Echo Victor is one. It cannot be done anymore. I think I managed just to, to frail. The same with Colonel Jan. We can't do it. Too frail. So I want to urge all of you listening here. Age is going to get you. <laughs> you know, with that guy who said taxes and death is the only thing, you know, yep. which, is, which is for real in life. So don't hesitate in contacting me. We don't know what's going to happen next week or the week after we had three two battalion members on where we were making the dates and Saturday we would then go into God's service before we could get to it. So I want to say to all of you, don't, don't hesitate, don't play around and think, oh, we'll do this later. You know what? These stories will get lost with you. I think we owe it to our own people that we can bring our version out. And then we can be just. And I'm not scared of being just. But do not judge me or anybody else unless you've heard both sides of a story. And that's what lawyers are speaking you now. And I think it's just fair because there's a lot of nonsense out there. You talk about Kasinga. If you mention the name Kasinga to any NATO officer, they will tell you it was a massacre. And they will show you little pictures which were so doctored that you had to laugh about it. And then you show them Look, here's the evidence. People themselves say it's not true. And then they stare at you with these big damn eyes and they won't, will not believe you. So, so it's for us to start talking. And, 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 our, and certain Afrikaans will feel a say, Mens ons hart op my tyd uit. Ons moet ons story te gaan uitkry. As ons dit nie uitkry nie wat gaan gebeur. Ah ja, we have to stay on actually. Dis ook om ek sikke goed koop vir myself. Wat jy vir jyself kan, van die feite kan staan en om Janse boek, ek meen, wat merkwaardig is van om Janse boek, en het nou niks my uit te waai nie, is dat die jump lijste en sy handgeskrewe orders is nog hier in. Ek meen, dis goed wat ons vir die nageslag moet bewaar. And coming back to what you've just said, my concern is, they're now trying to establish a new pro patria museum at the Voortrekker Monument here in Pito. The Elks are doing a hell of a job in trying, but the border war is gone. The people are gone. The guys that were in the front lines are not there anymore. If we don't collect and tell these stories, it's going to go missing. And that's the only reason why I also believe it's important. I mean, I was no hero. I mean, I'm a guy that believes, uh, you know, there is no such thing as a hero. We had a job to do. I was put in 3-2 Battalion to do a, a job, and I've done it to the best of my ability, and that's all I can say. And I mean, uh, to come back to what you say, what the guys say about Kasinga, personal belief again, and I mean, again, it's controversial, but it's my own view. There is no thing as a war crime because war is a crime in itself. Well, as you know, I live just next to uh, Geneva. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you have to laugh about the way which the road we took. I wish I would understand that, actually. Because even in all, there's no such thing as a just war. It does not exist. But I think people forgot about it. And I'll say the last thing, which is controversial as well, but you lived a, a large part of your life outside South Africa, in the different areas where we were working. And I can say to you people here, there's no such thing as home. There's nothing better than home. You can live in the outside. Yes, you can even do well in the outside. But deep down, deep down, you want to see the Southern Cross. And you want to be amongst your own people. Let us not forget that. I believe in that, but, uh, but I'm, 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 I actually I'm sharing your thing that we've got history that is going down the Western brain. And also there's a lot of kids that don't understand it. I mean, I had a guy that actually phoned me once about the, the book after he's read the 3 to Battalion book. And he says to me, yeah, but I just cannot understand it. So, you know, you're trying to explain to the guy that, yeah, perhaps it was, as the guy says, for Falk and Father at that stage. But really, we were called up 
we need to go to the army, we got a job to do, and we just done the job. And don't, I mean, the guy that tell me that you were not scared, man, you were scared, because the guy that says he was not scared is like, I mean, we were all scared in a contact situation. But actually, of course, and that's the last thing, what actually scared me more at the end is whenever we do a, a, a large operation, you're lying there, some guys has hit a contact, bullets and shit are flying around and you're not part of the contact. Then you're, you're then that's when you're getting scared. When you're part of the contact, you just take over, you do the what some drills and you carry on and that's just the reality. Would you say it, uh, it helped you in life afterwards? Well, because I'm, I'm, I'm not, yeah, it definitely helped me in life. But I'm a true believer that 3 2 Battalion did cross my path, or I did cause that, that I can never, I cannot complain, because in a sense, I've bring this over myself. But as I know, and I said to you before, I mean, I had a wife that was very sick, she died. My daughter was in high school. My two sons still in was primary school. But I think that's the, the preparation in life to teach you how to handle different situations. The other thing is I actually think it began, it learned you how to become a, was a manager and to lead by example. As we've just discussed before, the three, two groups, troops will not accept you if you haven't gone to the fight for it. And you had a lead from the front. And I mean, I think that has made an impact on myself to say, if you want to lead to the front, you just don't stand at the back and, and shout. You get up first and then you say a answer and everybody will move forward with you. And I think that is crucial to realize that that's an important lesson in life. And that's lesson learned. It's also a matter of faith, I suppose. I recall in our time in Nigeria, we quickly realized if we go to one of the local Nigerian churches, you would be treated like you are Jesus himself because you've got money. So we never went. Well, I never did. So we formed, we, we were living together, a whole bunch of us from different walks of life, myself from the police, you people, and other policemen as well. And we formed little small groups and we held our own church services. And I would often sit there and I would think, wow, yes, sir, Colonel, Commander of Special Task Force, I believe he was, or might have been uh, preaching to us, yes, a paratrooper sitting, yes, an armored guy, where were you yourself? And I was sitting there, and you know what, that was the closest thing I ever got to church, like in real church. I, I think that the, the main thing is you realize there was need for example, in Afghanistan, that very seldom happened because of the fact where you are and you between there was Muslims. I think there was just a lot of South Africans together with us in Nigeria and the need exists. And I agree. I mean, this is where, I mean, I have been to uh, East Church once, to the Church of the Nazareth. I was impressed with these his way of, of preaching, of standing up and preaching. But the other stuff was just not for me. I mean, the dissing out of, of stuff, uh, how people fall down. I mean, that was, just wasn't for me. So I, I understand exactly what you're saying. It's not in our belief and the way we see that uh, they're doing things. So, yeah, that's it. Uh, but as I always say, in the case of Wasn't Dupi, it actually shocked me uh, because, and I mean, we actually, I actually went to look at the Wasn't a bodies of both Dupi and Lawrence, and I mean, it was, I mean, they had to be identified with a DNA. They went down in the chopper, and I mean, I think from Afghanistan, the only thing that I will ever remember for the rest of my life is not the guys that got killed or anything. It's that day in the morning, that smell of burning human flesh. 
that remains with you for the rest of your life. You cannot get away from it. But that's life. I'm just lucky, because I'm one of the lucky ones. I got through it. I mean, that's it. And, but as I say, I think you, you just make your own luck. <laughs> well, it's like Gary Player said, the more you practice, the more luckier he gets. Luckier he gets. Do you have any advice? Last question for you. If there's a youngster looking here, perhaps he wants to join the army somewhere. Uh, perhaps a young platoon commander, somebody listening. Any advice? I think the main thing is to stay true for yourself. That's the first thing. Is The second thing is, no matter what you've done in life, because, I mean, a lot of guys would have said, I mean, we're just a bunch of A-wallers and not uh, knowing what you want to do. I mean, I think at that stage, yes, as youngsters, you get influenced. You must be careful that people influence you in a circle, certain way and go, get along with us. People must be very, must look at who's trying to influence them and in what way and be careful because you get guys out there that will influence you in the wrong way. And this, the last thing is, is just make a decision. I believe the fact is, and I've always done that, make a decision. If it's the wrong decision, be man enough to stay to stand up and say, it's the wrong decision, but it was at the information I had at that point in time, it was the best decision for me then. And it's now later, I've realized what is, it was a wrong decision, but I've lifted, I lived with it and I stick through with this. Then to not take a decision because I hate people that will not make a decision. Make a decision, carry on and live with it. I cannot improve on that. So I will end it here, and I will say to all of you who listened here up to now, thank you. Come and talk to us, and until we meet again, God bless you.